tied my hands. He said if I screamed, he'd kill me. How did last night end? We get accusations like this all the time. You just saw a glimpse of some of the shows and films that are part of a deluge of creations that feel like a direct response to the Me Too movement dealing with sexual harassment, rape and consent. So are we making progress in the way these subjects are treated on screen? I'm joined in the studio by writer and critic Iris Bray, who's written several books about the way women are represented, which include The Female Gaze, A Screen Revolution. And her latest book is aimed at educating teenagers about the subject. And from London, by Skype, we're joined by Catherine Angel, the author of Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again. Hello to both of you. Now, starting with you, Iris, your new book is a guide for young people to help them navigate the on-screen revolution that's taking place um, post Me Too. Historically, though, how have the subjects of sexual harassment, sexual assault and consent been portrayed on screen? They've always been portrayed on screen. That's what we have to understand. They've been here from the beginning of, of cinema with Alice Guy, even in the 30s in Russia. You know, there's a, a, a movie by a Russian filmmaker about rape. You can think about Ida, Ida Lupino in the 50s in the States, did outrage. So it's always been there. But those movies have not... Um, had the critical acclaim maybe that they have deserved or they've been buried under other movies because their subjects didn't seem as interesting. But today, I think people really crave um, those narratives and seeing those images. And so that's why I wrote this book, so that young people um, would know where to look to find those narratives. And Catherine, most of us will have witnessed um, sexual harassment on screen, but maybe we didn't realise it. Like in Goldfinger, when James Bond corners Pussy Galore in a barn and she eventually succumbs to his advances, or in Bridget Jones's diary where Hugh Grant's Daniel Cleaver as her boss emails her sexually suggestive messages and then mistreats her at work when the relationship breaks up. Your book is an analysis of female desire consent and sexuality in the age of Me Too. Has the treatment of the female experience on screen changed since Me Too, do you think? I think it is changing, yeah. And I think that um, it's partly that we're recognising as sort of really complex dynamics of power, interactions that previously we might have thought of as just in terms of seduction or romance, but we're beginning to see, you know, Bridget Jones is a really good example how that is a really powerful dynamic of inequality in the workplace that I think now would get treated very differently on the screen. And Iris, um, Game of Thrones, for example, one of the most popular series maybe ever, mm -hmm. has something like 50 rapes in it. Um, the Fall, True Detective, Luther, True Blood, sexual assault features in all of these. Um, I read something that 80% of pornography is rape pornography. Mm -hmm. Why do you think rape has long been a staple of TV entertainment? Because we've been taught that desire is tied to domination. Uh, and I think that's what we need to deconstruct. Um, and so the problem is not that those movies or TV series exist, is that they are in itself, they're, they're dominant. That's the dominant discourse. So we need to have other TV shows, other films that show that desire can come from a place of equality and no longer domination. And I think that's the key to really have a revolution. And after a Me Too, we've seen film and TV striving to do better when they're exploring um, these themes. Last year, we had the film Bombshell in the series The Morning Show, where women were calling out their aggressors and aggressors were being brought to account. Then there are more nuanced projects like The Assistant, Promising Young Woman, Bojack Horseman and I May Destroy You. Give us an example of a series that you think um, shows how we should be addressing these subjects. I think I May Destroy You is a very good example because you're always in the point of view of the female heroine and she is raped and we're, we're going to see the consequences of her rape through the 12 episodes. And I think that the TV series format is interesting because you actually have time to understand how power dynamics are working and how one event can actually affect your entire life and also your friends around you. And all those examples are important important because women can recognize what they've been living and then can put words onto it or even images onto it and then explain and understand their own experiences. And I think that's why fiction is important to and can have an impact on our daily lives.
And Catherine, um, I May Destroy You challenges the audience's often inflexible views on what constitutes a victim and how a victim ought to behave. We also see other sorts of betrayal of trust in this series, such as the seemingly spontaneous threesome that turned out to be planned by two men beforehand. She was tricked, in a way, into consenting. It's not a crime, but it's still a violation. Um, consent, it's not just yes or no, is it? No, and I think that's what was so beautiful about I May Destroy You. I think it's one of the most amazing pieces of television I've seen in a really, really long time, partly because she she really excavates, you know, the experience of sexual assault and the kind of all the ripples and the after effects it has, including the protagonist's kind of emergence as a sort of, you know, warrior on social media denouncing rapists, which, you know, works for her in some ways, but also becomes a source of its own kind of pain and trauma for her. It really deconstructs all the ways in which women are required to act in certain ways, either in order to prevent sexual assault, but also in order to kind of re rehabilitate themselves from it. That TV show was just really quite groundbreaking in its attention to the nuances of the effects of sexual violence. And I think, as you said, that scene where Terry has a threesome where she thinks that she has uh, you know been enabled to explore her own sexual desire autonomously you know as a as a young woman with sexual desire but it turns out that she was kind of maneuvered into position again a really subtle exploration of the way in which power dynamics work in really small kind of uh, piecemeal ways not just you know a stranger in the street assaulting you and Iris, your new book is addressed um, to young people, educating them about the images that surround us, not only in series and films, but in t video games. In video games, players actually have a very active role in what's going on in the action. And we spoke to the Atlanta-based Drew Crescent, who founded um, a charity called Gaming Against Violence. He told us about one of their video games aimed at teaching young people about consent, and it's called Respect Danis or Respect Dance. The narrator tells young people hey, you're at this dance and you don't know how to find somebody to dance with you. Well, first of all, find somebody that you're interested in, have a conversation with them, and then ask their permission if they want to dance. And of course, asking permission to dance is a form of consent. We want to ask permission before we engage in behavior. And then as the game goes on, you're reminded that even though you were you had permission to dance with somebody yesterday, that doesn't mean you have permission to dance with them today. Because consent is something that you don't only receive once. You have to receive consent every time you're engaging in that behavior. And Catherine, careless treatment of sexual violence on screen is, of course, a reaction to real life in which victims of assault are invariably treated suspiciously, their credibility and character scrutinised via their texts, social media accounts and sexual history, and very few reported rapes are prosecuted. Um, do you think that as TV and film change the way they tackle this subject, the wider problem could improve? I hope so. I mean, one of the things I find kind of dispiriting is that, you know, we get these waves and waves of movements that are really important. And, you know, these shifts in representation are hugely important. The resurgence, you know, periodically of women's speech about what's happened to them, you know, as we're seeing in the UK at the moment, we're seeing in France as well in relation to questions of consent. Um, but despite all this speech, the rates of sexual violence remain very constant. One of the things that I'm interested in in my book, which is that, you know, consent is an absolute must, obviously, for sex, and we have to get the law right. But some of the rhetoric around consent about, you know, women needing to be very clear about their sexual desire, to know their sexual desire and communicate clearly so that they don't experience coercive sex, I think ends up placing yet again the burden on women to be a particular kind of person in order to um, to not experience sexual assault. But the fact is, as, as you've kind of hinted towards, it's very difficult for women to just confidently and clearly assert their sexual desire because it's often their sexual desire that gets used against them. So I think, you know, we have to be really careful. Are we asking something that involves creating an ideal of which they will inevitably short, fall short because not everybody can be this confident expressor of sexual desire. And then who gets blamed for that? Now, Catherine, just before we go, I wanted to ask you about the title um, of your book, 
tomorrow sex will be good again. Is all this debate about sex ruining sex for us? No, I don't think so. I think the more we talk about sex, the better. And, you know, the title is kind of a bit ironic in a way. It's a quote from Michel Foucault when he was satirizing the counterculturalists of the 1960s. But, you know, the book is an exploration of whether we can be optimistic about sex and whether sex can get better for women. There is a lot of bad sex out there, not just sexual assault, but disappointing, painful, humiliating sex that women are having. How can we raise the bar in terms of what women themselves can expect and in terms of the kind of sex that men are being encouraged to you know, create, co-create with women, um, so that perhaps we can look forward to the future with optimism? My, my note of caution is that just focusing on the legal questions of consent is not the only solution. We have to think much more widely about whether we are enabling pleasure for women. Okay, and Iris, we're going to play out with one of your favourite series of the moment. And why are you a fan of normal people? Because I think that it shows that consent is can be linked to pleasure and that um, young women and young men need to be able to put words. And it is about exploration. And pleasure and desire are not things that you're just born with. It's things that you actually learn. And so learning what you want is a big part of um, sex. And I think the TV series really shows that. And that's why it's one of the examples that I give in my book, because I think it's um, exactly showing how language can be part of desire and talking about consent is not something that is going to make sex worse. It's actually going to make it better. And I think the TV series really shows how that can really open our minds to new explorations. Okay. Iris Bray, thank you so much for joining us. Your latest book is called Sous nos yeux, Petit Manifeste pour une révolution du regard. Catherine Angel, thank you so much for your company. Your book tomorrow, Sex Will Be Good Again, is out now. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Are you dating anyone problematic at the moment? I haven't had a midnight call from you in a while. It's so corrupt and sexy. What do you say your feelings are involved? Obviously. Who is it obvious to? They're known for their cuisine and saying hello with a kiss. They only work 35 hours per week, when they're not on strike, that is. How true are these clichés about France? Every week, Florence Villeminot tears apart stereotypes. Join us for insight into French culture and current events to understand what makes the French so unique. French Connections, presented by Florence Villeminot on France 24 and France24.com.